Hello, I'm Anthony. Today we're going to have a look at one of the new features in Hellion 7. It's called XLFO. It's basically um, an LFO that allows us to use two different axes, the X and Y axis, as different modulation sources simultaneously. So inside one LFO, we have two different LFOs. As I was set up today, we've got a really simple sound, a single oscillating sawtooth with a little bit of filter. Here's our cutoff at uh, 2.1K. That's our baseline sound for today. And I'm going to jump straight over to the LFO section. Here you can see our normal LFOs 1 and 2. And to the right of them, we've got X LFO. Let's click that. Slightly different view. We'll have a look at these. These are basically the different rate um, wave shapes that we've got. It's a, it's a really interesting feature. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but I'm going to show you some examples today that will hopefully demonstrate how all of this works. I'm going to use zone types today to lock open both the LFO pages and the filter section. We've got these side by side. This is going to make it much easier for me to demonstrate the drag and drop feature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to map the X coordinate of the XLFO to the filter cutoff and the Y axis to the, um, to the filter resonance. And you'll see those two uh, different modulation destinations playing against each other and you get a fairly complex graph that's going to get drawn in this little box down here that represents those two modulations working simultaneously. Now it's very simple to set these modulation uh, destinations because we have dedicated drag and drop features in the top bar. So you can see on the left hand side we've got drag x LFO x so this is the x axis as a modulation source. I'm going to pick that up I'm going to start dragging it the moment I did, every legal destination turns green and I'm going to drag X to the cutoff, drop it, and immediately the automatic zones for our modulation uh, destinations have appeared. So now we can see that the filter is mapped, the filter cutoff. So here's our filter modulation section and it's mapped to X LFO X. Similarly, on the, the right hand side of these two options, we can now drag Y onto resonance, and that's that done. Notice we haven't had to open the modulation matrix at any point, but of course we can view all of that information from that context as well. I'll open my modulation matrix, and now you can see here are our two routings, X to cut off, Y to resonance. And I'll use the matrix to dial in a little bit of initial value to each of these, but we don't really need it. I can click either of the other zones, which are locked, so they'll always be open. Click either of those, and the mod matrix will disappear again. So before we do anything else, let's have a quick review of what that sounds like. So what's happening in this page is that both the X and Y axis are increasing at exactly the same rate. That's basically going to draw a 45 degree angle. The moment I change either of these modulations, must have accidentally clicked on this one at some point. We're going to get a different wave shape in this window. I'll just set this one back to sign because my OCD won't be able to handle that. Okay, so I'm going to set the waveform of the X modulator to a square wave. So you can see this little blue line. This is our current modulation rate and we're locked to the host tempo at the moment. We're in sync mode. So the X LFO component of this cross LFO, think about it, two separate LFOs together. The X component, I'm going to have modulate in square wave form. So now the filter is going to jump, the cutoff is going to jump violently a la square wave, but the resonance is going to flow smoothly. So that's our first indication that these two different LFOs are both independent but tied together in, inside a single interface. Both of those oscillators are cycling at the same rate, but they're drawing different wave, sh wave shapes, and this is the composite output. Now, the curious thing about XLFO is this concept of our rate control, because ordinarily on an LFO, let's hop, hop over to LFO1, we have a simple frequency knob. That's how we control how fast the LFO cycles. When you don't do that, in XLFO mode, you have these steps over which you specify the rate of the LFO. Because we're currently locked to the host tempo, we're dealing in fractions of beats 
I'm going to pick this little blue line, this little blue marker, and I'm going to drag it to the left. And you can see it jumped in a discrete quantized state. I've now offset the rates of the X and Y LFO. X is going to oscillate slower than Y, and now we've got a really complex shape. Can you also see that because I've changed the rate, I've reverted back to a sine wave, so every single different rate on the low frequency oscillator, each low frequency oscillator, has a dedicated waveform. And as we cycle through the various rates, it's going to use different waveforms to describe that LFO behavior. Let's press a key. So now the cutoff is being modulated more slowly than the resonance. It's going to increase the amount of the resonance. Happens to be the currently viewed destination in our filter modulation. Let's make them go in opposite directions. I'll dial in some manual resonance and then make the modulation value between the X LFO Y axis and the filter resonance. I'll make this negative. And to really accentuate that cutoff being increased as the resonance is pulled back, I'm going to lock the two rates back up. So I'll pull rate Y down to one over two. So you can see in the visual display, these little orange buttons tell you what the current value is. They're basically uh, traveling in opposite directions now. just adjusting the resonance so that at its maximum extent it never actually quite bottoms out, it's always in motion. Great stuff. Now let's mess with some of the waveforms. Let's give the y-axis a saw down instead. It's all very well and good having these different rates for our different wave shapes. But the real juice comes when we start modulating the LFO rate because we can actually cycle through this. Think of it like a wavetable of modulation sources. That's the best way to think about it, I think. And we can actually cycle through this table because we have access to the X LFO rate, just like any other um, modulatable parameter in Halion. The first demonstration that I'll give you, because it's the simplest to wrap your head around, I'll use the modulation wheel. I'm just going to turn my modulation wheel physically all the way down to zero. I'm going to head into my modulation matrix. I'll do this bit manually. And I'm going to map my mod wheel to LFO, X LFO rate X. Then I'll dial in some depth, jump back to the LFO. Now I'll press a note. And as I increase the modulation wheel, you see the little orange dot in the LFO rate go up to map, to basically track where the modulation wheel's up to. And as I go through these different modulation rates, you can hear the different waveforms taking over. So if I map in, few different rates in the middle and then turn my mod wheel all the way back down to zero again get each one of those different waveforms being um, applied to the LFO dynamically now the modulation wheel is a fine kind of starting point from the demonstration because you can see quite clearly, you can't physically see my wheel, but this is basically a representation of it. As I'm moving the wheel, we're jumping up in discrete quantized steps through this rate chain, but it's much more fun if we ask Halion to do that for us dynamically. So instead of mapping my modulation wheel to the rate value, I'm gonna map LFO1 to it instead. So now, LFO1, which is over here, is going to cycle at one uh, second. Let's slow it down a bit. About three times, once every three seconds. It's going to draw a wave, a sine wave, which is going to scroll through these different rate targets. 
Now we've still got control over our center point. We, we have a bi-directional oscillator here. So we can cycle into positive territory and into negative ter territory. It's entirely up to us where we set our center point by picking up this little blue marker and dragging it. And obviously we're gonna set our depth with the LFO control, which is this thing down here. Now when I press a key, watch this little orange dot basically cycle through the different rates and listen to what we get. So as it jumps through each of these different wavetables, for that moment in time, while the modulation is passing through that rate zone, we switch waveforms dynamically and you get this really interesting stutter effect. You can see the different shapes being drawn um, in the window as well. This is why I slowed the LFO LFO down because it's doing its thing every three seconds, but it's doing an awful lot of work over those three seconds as it scans through these different LFO rates. Let's pull it down even further, make it pretty slow. It's about every six seconds now. going to give it a little bit of consistency over this middle period where it gets to do triangle for three waves. Give it a couple of squares. See what that sounds like. So let's just have a review of that because it, it is potentially a little bit confusing. We've got two different LFO rates being superimposed upon each other. LFO1 is a modulator that's basically scanning dynamically through this particular wavetable. But that wavetable does two different jobs. Not only does it describe different shapes that the cross LFO, the X LFO, is going to apply to whatever destination it happens to be mapped to. At the moment, we're just playing with the filter cutoff and resonance. It's going to change the shape of that modulation but it's also going to change the speed of it at the same time. So we get two different modulation effects. LFO1 is the thing that's driving the change of rate. The cross LFO itself is determining the shape of the waveform uh, source and also its speed. And those two things are intrinsically linked together. It's an unusual concept to link the different waveforms to different rates of modulation. And this is really a brand new way for me of thinking about modulation matrices. I've never considered applying the concept of a wavetable to the rate of a low frequency oscillator. It's a really interesting concept. I'm just gonna disconnect the Y modulation, the one that's connected to resonance. I'm gonna take that away. I remove modulation. And now only the X component of the XLFO is mapped. Verify that in the mod matrix. Also I'm going to disengage this dynamic control of the rate. I want to simplify everything down to the simplest level so that we've just got a nice, easy modulating cutoff. Let's hear that. So that's a, a triangle filter, as you can see in this shape that's being described, just operating on filter cutoff. I'm going to slow that down a bit so that it's easier for us to hear. And turn this one into a triangle as well. Keep everything consistent. Now, every time I press a key, you can hear that LFO basically free running in the background. That's because retrigger mode is currently off. If I lock it to first note, every time I press a note, it's going to sound exactly the same. It's going to begin its modulation journey from uh, zero degrees phase. In other words, the beginning of its triangle wave. Up at the top of this graph. So if I press a chord, you see those second and third notes didn't have anything to do with the wave. It's only the first note that matters. In each note mode, that's not the case. You can see it beginning its phase journey. In other words, drawing this shape, this triangle shape at the beginning of the graph every time I press a new note. Sync to host simply locks us to the, the underlying structure of the uh, of the door so now depending on where we are in the beat structure you can see me scrolling manually through the song position here that's what sync to host does I set us back to first note because that's the simplest so i'm in complete control every time i press a key 
I'm going to begin my LFO from the beginning. Well, I will do as long as the phase is at zero degrees. Now I'm going to start pressing this note and increasing the phase control and you'll see the wave basically gets drawn from a different starting position each time. Basically ignoring the first part of the drawing of the wave and starting from some forward facing arbitrary position. That's basically shifting the wave forward in the future. That's what moving the phase does. As I pull it back, this is going to basically end up back at the top of our chart, which is right here. Needless to say, all of this stuff, you've got independent control of both X and Y. So you can basically set their phases opposite. You can have sine waves for both of them, but if they're 180 degrees out of phase, one will be at its maximum extent when the other one is at its minimum. You can specify random phase. So now every time I press a key, it's going to choose a different point on this triangle path to begin drawing its wave from. This free control here that my mouse is currently underneath allows us to disable the quantized nature of our change in rate. If I pick this little rate marker up and drag it to the right, you can see it jumps in a discrete step. It's either one over three in triangle mode or one over four in square mode. But when I engage the free option, I've got all of those discrete values in between. So now it's going to be a very slight change of rate in between the minimum and maximum extents of this particular control. So it's going to get halfway to a third before it jumps over to the third ratio, which will then be at the upper upper limit of is it, it, its extent. So you do get a, a smooth transition. except that you've got a brand new different waveform. So it's cycling at, this, at, at a consistently slowing pace, but now we've completely changed waveform. If I make that change with consistent waveforms, it should be almost indistinguishable. Yeah, it's not possible to tell where one rate control LFO takes over uh, from the other. Now, everything that I've demonstrated today has been involving the filter, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't have the X and Y components mapped to completely different destinations. So this time I'll map the Y modulation source to pitch, and we'll dial in some of that. So now we're gonna get varying cutoff on the X axis and pitch on the Y axis. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed this demo. If you did, please hit like. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.